powered by the Inside the Birds podcast. Now, live from inside the Matt Black Kia Studios, this is Football at Four. Football at Four is powered by the Inside the Birds podcast, and it is brought to you by Caesars Entertainment Group of Atlantic City. Come experience the ultimate sports destinations all season long at the Wild Wild West, Tropicana, and Harris Resort, Atlantic City. Book your game day experience today at Caesars.com. Jeff Mosher from the Inside the Birds podcast is here, and I would uh, imagine, Jeff, that uh, you are somewhat surprised at a 32-6 to uh, dismantling of the Atlanta Falcons. I don't know what you had as a pick in the game. I don't remember whether you took the Eagles or the Falcons, but I would imagine you didn't think it would be a domination. No, I took the Falcons, Mike. I was the only person out of the four of us on our pregame show to do that. And my my theory was that I felt that it was a coin flip game and that Atlanta being the home team and also the team that had a little bit more, obviously more experience at the quarterback, more experience at wide receiver. I felt the Eagles were the better team in the trenches. And that always gives you a chance to win. Just didn't really know what to expect. I, I, it's not that I thought the Eagles couldn't win. I just kind of gave the experience factor and the home factor of the Falcons. And boy, did that not matter at all. <laughs> no, uh, and I, you know, I picked Philly and I had him pretty handily, mainly because of what you said, the trenches. I thought the Eagles offensive line, and that's what I've been saying all offseason, Moses. I think their offensive line is very good. Until somebody gets hurt on that front five, they will have the better offensive line in almost every single game they play, which means they should be able to compete. But to compete, you have to have the skill players make plays. So let's get what you saw on Sunday from from really Hurts. Let's start with him to make us feel better about the skill players being able to make plays. If the line plays well, what did we learn about the skill set, the skilled players? Well, I mean, obviously there's a lot of speed on this offense as compared to years past when, you know, since after 2017, after Torrey Smith was traded to Carolina, they've tried to get speed, you know, Mike Wallace and then Deshaun Jackson and drafting Jalen Rager last year. But for injury reasons, mostly um, they just haven't been able to get that speed on the field. And they've had to be a two tight end offense a lot more than they've wanted to be. But now with Jalen Rager healthy, Devontae Smith healthy, Quez Watkins in year two, starting to, be a little bit more productive, add that to that Miles Sanders. And Miles Sanders isn't just looking around by himself, wondering where all the dynamic playmakers are. He's, he's got some people among him uh, in the wide receiver group. And I think that that enabled Nick Sirianni, Shane Steichen, Kevin Petula, the offensive brain trust to go into this game and say, let's do our best to show as many different formations as possible. We can play 11. We can play 12. We can move guys around. We can use our running backs who have also good speed and pass catching ability. And we'll throw the kitchen sink at them from a formational standpoint. And for Jalen Hurts, I, the, the big takeaway for me, Mike, is that when you go on the road and you're making your first official start as the Eagles starting quarterback, I know he started, you know, four games last year, but nobody, I think every week Doug would never say he's definitely our starting quarterback, right? So this it's official. It's your first time. No turnovers. I thought that was really big. I mean, he did not put the ball in harm's way very often. Made good reads, quick, accurate delivery. And again, that's a function of the offense that was designed. But the fact that he was able to, uh, on a few occasions, get out of some trouble, make a throw on the run or throw the ball away, and no fumbles or turnovers was fantastic. All right, let me uh, get your thoughts on... Just the game that, that Sirianni called, the formations, the way mm-hmm. they looked, uh, the different looks they showed. Yeah, and I was expecting to see a lot of different formations, but not that many different. And not just formations, but also um, play designs, RPOs, read option. I mean, yeah, you know, high-low routes, crossers. You really had a, the whole, like I said, the whole kitchen sink there. It looked like the Eagles – had more than a week to prepare for this game, which they did. But so did every other NFL team as you get to the end of training camp. But it it felt like the Eagles were able to execute mostly everything they wanted to execute. In other words, when I watched that game, Mike, it was almost so um, clinical in in a way. And I would say most of the time, and I haven't watched the tape yet, but it, it felt like Jalen Hurts for the most part got to get the ball to his first read when he wanted to that it seemed like very almost Kyle Shanahan-esque in the way 
that everything seemed intentionally schemed and worked. You know, you watch a 49ers game, right? And it's, it's mind boggling just how every play seems to have somebody isolated so that they can get the ball and nobody's within five feet of them. So that it felt like that at times that everything, every button they were pushing was working and that it was all not just the first 15 plays, but it's almost like the entire playbook was scripted there and things were just working bang, bang, bang. Interestingly enough, um, you know, you look at um, Sirianni on the offensive side, the defensive side of things, Jonathan Gannon's defense didn't get out of the gates nearly as crisp, but he made some adjustments and tweaks in that game. What did he do? Uh, they didn't give up points. They gave up a lot of yards in the first two series. But after that, mm-hmm. they really – how were they able to shut Atlanta down after the first two series? Yeah, I'm not sure if it was more on what Jonathan Gannon did or and more or more so what the offense did. I think the defense obviously was bend but not break for the first two series and to hold them to field goals and only six points instead of 14 was crucial. But once the Eagles went up 15-6 to six in the third quarter on a game little touchdown – now you're up by, or maybe it was 22 to 6 after that one. Once they went up double digits, Mike, that put Atlanta in a position where it couldn't, it couldn't just start running the ball all over them again. They really had to pass. It was not their strength. Matt Ryan was uh, holding onto the ball at times, and you know, at other times he was just feeling the rush. And once I felt that it became a double digit game, it made the Falcons very one dimensional, and that was the dimension that was easy for the Eagles to attack because, as we said, they were going to be stronger up front than the Falcons' offensive line. So they got the tee off more so. And then every once in a while, Atlanta would try to to pop a run in there, and and it didn't work. But I definitely think that's something we can keep an eye on more, say, this Sunday when the 49ers come to town because you know they like to run and you know they like to come up with run schemes that really specifically cater to the defense's weaknesses. And I, I, I don't know that much changed. I did see some guys up on the line of scrimmage in the second half, but um, we'll have to see how that how that unfolds on Sunday. That's that's one of the things where you're kind of I want to I want to I want another week to judge that before right. I make any decisions. Well, in the preseason, they were terrible against the run, and they were bad against the run for at least a half yesterday. So, is that the Achilles' heel that needs to be fixed? Well, I think it, one thing we talked about a lot on Inside the Birds going into the year is that Jonathan Gannon was going to have to figure out a way to. Um, scheme his run defense meaning you don't just line up and play the run you 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 intentionally do things whether putting a guy an extra guy in the line or um shooting the a gap per se right at the snap because you're trying to funnel the run in a certain direction and he it, it would be best for the eagles to funnel the run to the edges because eric wilson and alex uh singleton are much better at running sideline to sideline and making tackles than they are downhill they're not downhill guys they're not very big and they don't get off blocks the way some of the better linebackers in the NFL do. Uh, But I guarantee you that Kyle Shanahan, as we bring this up again, is going to try to do whatever he can to get his, his athletic mobile offensive lineman out into space and up into that second level to cover those guys up and run at them because they have to prove that they can stop the run and the 49ers can score points. The Falcons can, could not. So the Eagles can't just say our run defense will be reliant on us just having a lead and making the other team have to pass. They've got to be able to stop the 49ers from getting like six or seven yards on first down and setting up those those back-breaking second and third or second and four where it's play action all, all day long. Well, let me ask you this. Um, you have Calvin Ridley, Kyle Pitts that we were all kind of waiting to see. How are the Eagles able to kind of – neutralize those two they didn't get beat with the big play at all in the game yeah you know obviously this is a new style of defense and Jonathan Gannon does a lot differently on the back end than Jim Schwartz would do Uh, he plays a lot of different coverages including two safeties deep occasionally some inverted Tampa two some number one robber which is when the safety looks like two and then the safety kind of runs to the middle to kind of patrol that area and take away that that short field so first of all Matt Ryan didn't always know what defense he was going to be throwing at once he snapped the ball. And then secondly, he gave some protection to his wide receivers uh, by having a a safety deep. And third, when, when the pass rush was as good as, as it was against the Falcons and a bad Falcons O line, it's really just, it's tough in general to get your offensive uh, passing game going. Yeah. I think um, that will be uh, interesting to see down the road because 
last year Slay had some troubles with those bigger, bigger, uh, big play wide receivers, and I thought he did a really good job with Ridley yesterday. Uh, and, and as you mentioned, I thought Hargrave and Fletcher Cox, those two, Cox didn't send up show up in the box score at all, but they had to double mm-hmm. him, and Hargrave took advantage of he absolutely and Ridgeway. I mean, Ridgeway <laughs> got Ty poor Ty McGill cut. I uh, know. How dare him? Uh, no, there was a lot of pocket pushing going on there. Um, and, and look, you saw in the first quarter, I the respect because I, I wouldn't call Matt Ryan the most athletic quarterback in the world, but Arthur Smith certainly designed a lot of plays that had Matt Ryan trying to roll to the right, roll to the left, get him on the run, which I don't know is his strength, but he knew he had to get uh, Matt Ryan away from the interior of the offensive line where Jalen Mayfield, the kid from Michigan, was making his uh, first start as a rookie. He obviously struggled. So they had to kind of come up with creative ways to try to get that passing game going. And it did early on, but then it stopped. In fact, I can't remember ever watching a game. We talked about this on the pod, Mike. Maybe you would agree. I think Calvin Ridley had four catches on the first drive, right? And and it was like, bang, Calvin Ridley, bang to Calvin Ridley, bang. And then there was a, a sequence for the Eagles where Quez Watkins caught three straight balls, like, Bang the quiz, all screens, yeah. and then like the first three, three plays later, of the game. The first three plays yeah, of the game yeah. were Watkins, Watkins, Watkins. And then, and then later in the game, there was that sequence where Jalen Hurts targeted Devontae Smith four times in a row. I've never seen such a, like guys targeted that often, that frequently in such a cluster before. But then you almost didn't hear about him for the rest of the game. Calvin yeah. did nothing after that. Quez Watkins didn't do anything after that. Yeah, but I'll tell you what, Jeff, the, the Quez Watkins thing, I really was impressed by because. I love the way that he said, I'm going to go to Watkins three times. It made you have to account for him the rest of the game. Like, because of his speed, that if he just goes streaking down the seam, you had to pay attention because, oh, he's in the game plan. We have to pay attention. They never went back to him. But that's like something that they could shelf and use, hey, two, three weeks down the line where Mm -hmm. we don't show, we don't show, and then boom. So I love that they went to – it was like – of all guys, Watkins gets the first three plays, but I think there was a method behind that madness. I also think yeah, I think they started off in the hurry up too, just like Atlanta did. So they clearly found a defensive look that they felt a screen uh, a swing pass to Watkins was good for, and then they hurried it up, and then Atlanta gets right back in defense. They're playing the same look, so we're going to do it again. It's almost like we're going to do this because you're in a look that you can't stop this. Yeah. And then obviously eventually the, the clock stops or there's an incompletion and they get to substitute and things change. But I agree with you that it loosened up the the Atlanta defense at first and then they had to kind of respect that speed and uh you know, right, you know, on the quick swing pass for the whole game. Well, and they went with the first play call of the game is the play they use against Pittsburgh. And it was like, look, accentuate the positives. Like, how many times were you saying, hey, like last year, it seemed like the Eagles offense was, hey, John Hightower, just run straight down the field and let's see if we can air one out. And look, they didn't take any shots down the field from my recollection yesterday. Everything was a little too safe almost. Nah, nah, mm-hmm. I don't want to say too safe. That sounds like a negative. But they didn't take very many shots, if any, yesterday. Whereas last year, all they did was take shots. And it's like, hey, you got these guys that can work well in space and didn't utilize them. So that was what I liked. Yeah, no, I agree with you on that. I thought that there was probably more formational variety in the first quarter uh, of uh, yesterday's game than there might have been all of last year. And you're right, it was opposite in that there was not a lot of vertical presence to the game. It seemed like the the coaches, the team, the whole concept was we can move the ball horizontally against this defense and just kind of march up and down the field using everybody at our disposal. I mean, the deepest pass, I think, went to Zach Ertz. So um, they were able to do that, and it worked. But I, I would tend to agree with you, it, 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 not to attach a negative connotation to it, but obviously, as you go on, it wasn't there, necessary. when you have opportunities to drive the ball, you're going to have to do it. Yeah. Right? It wasn't necessary to take your shot. So shelve those plays for another week. You know what I mean? Like, right. hey, I don't right. have to use play action. Because we saw, like, no play. We saw RPOs, but nothing, you know, really play action-wise and setting things. I think they used this week to set things up in weeks down the road because the game kind of got away from Atlanta. There was something else. I thought uh, the running back tandem, Sanders, and I think we found out that Kenneth Gainwell is your other guy. Yeah, we've been saying that on Inside the Birds for a while, that as long as Kenneth Gainwell showed in training camp, in OTAs, that he could handle the workload, understand the base offense, understand the installs, not put the ball on the floor, do what he's supposed to do, he's going to get a role 
because we knew how much the coaches liked him. We knew what kind of play characteristics they like in a running back like him and that they would use that opportunity to get him on the field early. I've been saying it all, all season long. He will be on the field early in the year as long as he can handle it, and he has handled it, and he is right now the number two, and they're going to – he, he is going to be used, and he is being used the way the Colts used Naheem Hines. It, it just, that's his role. Uh, talk with Jeff Mosher from the Inside the Birds podcast. Eagles win 32-6. to six. Um, The offensive line was absolutely dominant. Um, I want to get your thoughts on the Mylotta contract. And good move, bad move. Did they jump the gun on this? How did he play? Give me your overall view because I had people like this was a terrible wild. They didn't. They needed to wait to see more of him. This is a classic Eagles move, though. Identify young talent, sign him early. The problem is, I said, is this guy's going to be so good that two years from now he's going to be saying I'm underpaid. You're absolutely right, and that's why he only signed. I'm guessing a four year deal. I'm guessing that's why it was only offered because he's got a short sample of of playing in the NFL. So he will have an opportunity to get another contract in two years if he makes two Pro Bowls. But at that point, I think the Eagles even understand that if that's the case, that they would have to read. You know, they've done that before. They've done it with Lane Johnson. They've done it with other players that when they look like they're young and ready for a second or a third contract, they'll give you more money to make you, um, you know, kind of uh, commensurate with what the market is, especially when you're young and you're on an offensive lineman. They, they treat those guys really well. So we'll see in two years. Look, I think it's – it's one of the moves that I, I, you know, if someone says it's a terrible deal, they may not necessarily be wrong. I mean, it, it, at the end of the day, they may be right. And if someone says this is a great deal, at the end of the day, they may be right. It's just impossible to look into the crystal ball and figure out what this guy's value is. Mm -hmm. It's just there's no comps to it, right? A seventh-round pick who's a starting left tackle and a really good one. I mean, I'm sure it's happened before, but – I don't know if yeah, you yeah, Jason all the Peters was undrafted, now. right? I mean, like, this happens. Right, There's right. guys who offensive linemen, but this is a guy who played no football, zippo, zero, exactly. nada. Right, right. Yeah, that makes it such a unique negotiation. So you can say the Eagles gave up too much, but the bottom line is, what if he plays really well this year? This is his con. This is his fourth year. It's his contract year. So if he was playing really well for the first ten or eleven weeks. He might say, well, now I'm just five, six weeks away from free agency and someone's going to pay me, you know, $200 million. Or you're holding the Eagles to the fire saying, look, this guy's going to make this much in free agency. You had a chance to wrap him up earlier for about 10 to $15 million a year less. Now you got to pay the piper. So every contract extension for a young, un, young rising player is like that. People thought the Carson Wentz contract was really good when he signed it. Some people did. Some people thought it was also awful. But – the reason why people thought it was good was because you're only paying him $26 million a year when Dak's about to go make $40 million. So you're, that's $15 million less, right? Yeah. It looked good at the time. Now it doesn't. I mean, it, you just never yeah. know. The Eagles are big on identifying the young player and trying to get them under control before you know they really can make money. That, that was the Andy Reid era, and you had guys holding out because they thought they were underpaid. Brian Westbrook and – uh, Sheldon Brown and, and like a lot of these players were like, hey, I'm underpaid. Well, you signed that contract two years ago. You shouldn't have signed it. And right. That's it. They changed the rules. Exactly. Because of that. Exactly. <laughs> Jeff Mosher from the Inside the Birds podcast. Um, that being said, the offensive line was other than the penalties. You can win with that offensive line, right? I don't see why not. I mean, I know that the Falcons don't have a, a, a you know, they're not loaded with pass rushing talent. Grady Jarrett's a good player. And, you know, there were times that he gave them a little bit of trouble. But for the most part, they ran the ball effectively. They threw the ball with protection. I think Jalen Hurts was sacked once. So, if was he sacked? I don't yeah, think, I think so. he was sacked once. Oh, no, maybe zero times. So, he wasn't under duress one time, a whole lot. One time, one time. One time, okay. Right. So, and by uh, and the again, way, sometimes I think it was, sacks. Yeah, the, the Jarrett, uh, that was early in the game, too, where Jarrett kind of pressed – Pressured him. He went out that's of bounds. Right. Yeah. That, uh, right. Well, wait a minute. That shouldn't have been a sack. No, that wasn't the, the sack. Bounds, but that it? was one. Oh, okay. That was one where you were right. That that Jarrett beat um, Lane, uh, Lane. Lane Johnson was kind of up and down. Yeah, I mean, look, you can definitely knock him for the holding penalties, and maybe in the fall starts, maybe that's the lack of preseason time showing up or being on the road in a first game, working on a silent count. You know, there there could be a a whole lot of different reasons for that. Yeah. But as far as protection and blocking, they, they checked all the boxes. 
Let me tell you. For one week. <laughs> seeing Brandon Brooks, Jason Kelsey, Brandon Brooks, Lane Johnson out there was a breath of fresh air. Seeing those guys. I thought Sayamala played pretty well. He had a couple penalties himself. But Sayamala and Mailata together on that side could become, you know, because I thought Sayamala played pretty well when he wasn't getting penalties. Well, allow yourself to think about this, even though we're all, we should all just take it one day at a time. But Jordan Mailata is 380 pounds. Not 360 as he's listed. He's 380. And there's going to be a point where Landon Dickerson's going to get in this game. And maybe it's at left guard because either Sam Allo gets hurt or Sam Allo is playing center and Jason Kelsey's not. Long. I don't know. But there's going to be a time where you got a 380 pound Jordan Mailata and a 300 and what, 55 pound Landon Dickerson next to each other, putting a combo block on some defensive lineman who's about 302 on a good day or yeah. 310, right? That's going to be interesting to see. Well, I'll tell you what, Moch. It's funny you say that because uh, earlier today I said, you know, the young skill players with this aging offensive line, they're going to start having to replace Lane Johnson, Brandon Brooks, Jason Kelsey. Now, you got Dickerson. He's going to replace somebody. But Mm -hmm. you're going to have to start infiltrating younger offensive linemen to go with these skill position players. For this year, it might just be a pretty good storm. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, they're high on Jack Driscoll. He's he he's on IR with a broken hand. He'd be a top backup right now at uh, guard and tackle. Um, I don't know if Nate Herbig is somebody they see as a starter, but I do think they see Jack Driscoll. They see starting potential, and he had a nice camp. He played well uh, last year toward the end of the year as he started to get more time. I get it. He was a rookie picked in the fourth round, but I, I there's no doubt in my mind, and unless they make more moves in the draft, which is always possible with all the picks they have, but that they view Landon Dickerson certainly, and I think very favorably they view Jack Driscoll as a potential interior offensive lineman going forward. Uh, Real quick, thoughts on Devonta Smith? Oh, man. (laughs) You know what he said after the game was like, somebody asked him, you know, when did you know you were going to get a touchdown? And he said, you know, as soon as we lined up. And so I saw man-to-man. And uh, you just love that kind of attitude. Um, Did a nice job. Caught the ball when it was thrown to him. There was a couple in traffic, too, where, you know, he absorbed the hit. Got up. Everything's good. Look, he's about as smooth of a route runner as I've seen from an Eagles wide receiver, rookie wide receiver. God, maybe ever. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, I'm trying to think of the rookies that came in and had route running ability like that. Jason Mott was pretty good. Uh, You know, Deshaun was not the type of guy who ran six or seven different routes to perfection. He was a a deep ball guy. Jeremy Macklin was a, a pretty good route runner. But coming out of that Missouri spread, I think not not in the same echelon as Devontae Smith as a rookie route runner. So it's been really impressive to see and very unique to see. All right. Week one in the books. And the guys over at the Inside the Birds podcast have plenty more on this. Check out the Inside the Birds podcast, Apple Store, Google Play, wherever you get your podcasts or of Google Podcasts, Apple, whatever they're called. You know where you can get them, <laughs> wherever you listen to a podcast. If you don't know where you listen to a podcast by now, that's on you. I'm a Google guy. I get mine in the Google Podcast area. Jeff Mosher, at Jeff Mosher NFL. Check out his 10 observations on the Eagles over at InsideTheBirds.com. Uh, tomorrow, Andrew DeCecco's thoughts on Kenneth Gainwell's role in this offense. Check that out for tomorrow's Football at Four. All right, Mosh, week one, man. It's in the books. It goes fast. It certainly does. I'll talk to you Wednesday. All right, that's Jeff Mosher. He will be back on Wednesday from the Inside the Birds podcast. And, of course, Football at Four is brought to you by here on the Sports Pass each and every day at 4 o'clock. We talk NFL. It's brought to you by Caesars Entertainment Group of Atlantic City. Come experience the ultimate sports destination all season long at Wild Wild West, Tropicana, and Harris Atlantic City. Book your game day experience now at Caesars.com.